<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. The committee will come to order. Welcome to our first meeting. So I'm kind of out of breath. I had to run over from the Capitol. So sorry that we're starting a few minutes late. It is my intention to start these meetings on time as much as is humanly possible. And we will, of course, attempt to end on time because you all have a lot of commitments. Um, and we want to make sure that we, that we uh, do that for everyone. So um, we don't have any minutes to approve. Um, I believe that a quorum is present. And um, so I'd like to start by introducing, um, having all of you introduce yourselves. Um, but maybe what we should do is uh, first start with the staff. And because um, um, they're going to be very, very important to all of us. And um, why don't we just start here with Ms. Pugnelli, if you want to just say your name and what you do, and we'll go around that way. Madam Chair, my name is Danielle Pinelli. I work for the House Research Department. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm Doug Berg. I'm a fiscal analyst for the committee. Madam Chair, Joe Durheim, DFL Caucus Research. Absolutely. Okay. Madam Chair, Jeremiah Wingstead with House Republican Research. Madam Chair, Elizabeth Clarkvist with House Research. And Randy Chun with House Research. All right, thank you to those folks. And now let's start around maybe with Representative Zerwas. And what I'd like to do without taking a lot of time, and we are a pretty big committee here, so anything that we all take a few seconds for is gonna add up. But I just would like to, instead of kind of a, the big where you're from, but I'd like to, if you would just give us a few seconds on either your background or your interest in the topic of health and human services. Would you start, Representative Zerwas? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members, Nick Zerwas. I represent uh, Big Lake Elk River. Uh, uh, in my fourth term now in the House, served on this committee um, all four terms, and I try to come at the uh, topic area uh, from the perspective of a lifelong patient. Thank you. Madam okay. Chair, uh, David Baker from the great area of Candioy County, Wilmer, straight west of here, about 100 miles. Um, small business owner. Uh, I think uh, I have also been um, really appreciative of being on Health and Human Services since my arrival here. Uh, I'm just starting my third term. This will be my fifth year starting. Um, and I guess I uh, really care about opioids, uh, mental health, but also how, as a business person, too, we can really dive into lowering the cost of health care uh, with affordable stuff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, Barb Haley from 21A. That's uh, Goodyear County and Wabasha County, so along the Mississippi River south of here. Uh, Red Wing is my home. Uh, and uh, health care, health insurance, access, affordability, uh, quality. Those are really all the reasons why I even ran for office. Uh, it's the number one issue facing constituents in my district. We have a lot of uh, small business owners and farmers and seniors. So they have all been uh, heavily impacted by the cost of care and concerned about reduced access in rural Minnesota. So I'm, I'm pleased to serve on this committee, served on it uh, last session or last term as well, and would like to see us all work together to solve problems that are facing our state. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. You. Madam Chair, uh, Jeremy Munson, District 23B, which is uh, Watanwan, Wasika, Blue Earth, and uh, um, Sewer counties in uh, <laughs> southern Minnesota. Um, I'm, uh, I'm here because uh, I ran for office because of health care. I lost my health insurance uh, last year uh, due to the, 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 the private market uh, being out, out pricing us. And I'm trying to do everything I can to lower costs and uh, increase access. We have a lot of uh, constituents that have insurance uh, as required by law, but the deductibles are so high they're afraid to go to the doctor. So I'm, I'm interested in price transparency in healthcare, increasing competition, and uh, lowering costs uh, through that through those pressures. Thank you. As State Rep. Glenn Grunegan, this is my fifth term on the HHS committees, and I am not on psychotropic drugs. No. <laughs> The, uh, my interest is uh, I have uh, strong concerns that the growth of Medicaid is going to have a damaging effect on our health care system, one of the best in the world, and also eventually bankrupt uh, the state of Minnesota. 
that's not my opinion. Tom Gillespie, the force. And Representative Gronhagen, if I might, we just want to say what is your interest. I don't want you to give a policy uh, oh. treatise where this is really short. We need to get all the way around. By the way, just to finish my thought, and then I'll, uh, uh, I'll uh, end. Uh, Tom Gillespie, the former state demographer, said if we don't get government health care growth under control, there will be no additional money for roads or bridges, K-12, or higher ed. And uh, so I have strong concerns about expanding government on health care. I do see increased competition, reforming the private health insurance market, and increasing access for all Minnesotans <coughs> as a top priority. And uh, that's one of the reasons I'm interested in this committee. Thank you. And I'm open to correction from the chair. <laughs> Jen Schultz, I represent East Duluth, and I'm in um, my third term here. And I ran for office to work on health care reform, uh, studying health economics for the last 25 years. I have a deep interest in this area, and I want to make sure that everyone has affordable health care. Even people with employer-sponsored insurance are, having, are struggling to afford their health care services, and most insurance, uh, health insurance programs and health care is not owned by the government. So... Um, there's not, we can't solve all those problems, but where we can solve it, that's my goal, is to work on health care reform to make sure everybody has access to health care. Thank you. Ms. Niederhofer, why don't you introduce oh. yourself, too? <laughs> Kristen Niederhofer, um, legislative assistant. Jenny Nash, the fill in CA. <laughs> so just a comment. So uh, Kristen Niederhofer has been my LA for a long time. She's great. She's going to, this is, I'm so thrilled to have her as the CLA on this committee. And um, Jenny Nash is filling in. We have a CA who's going to start on Friday. So this week, we're going to have kind of musical chairs for our CAs. And thank you for helping us today. Um, Elise Mann, representing 56B, which is Lakeville, Burnsville. I am a family medicine and ER physician um, here. Interest in healthcare, obviously, from the firsthand experience I have in watching patients struggle and suffer on a regular basis. Interested in healthcare reform, payment reform. Thank you. Joe Schumacher, I'm the uh, Republican lead for the committee, and I come from the southwest corner of the state where we have a population that's aging, and our number one employer is long-term care in the district, and so I am here to learn more to best serve them. Uh, Hunter Cantrell, representing House District 56 A. I'm in my first term at Savage in Burnsville. Um, I uh, uh, ran because I uh, underwent several months of chemo in 2017 and saw just how to control the cost of health care in the state of Minnesota. So really making sure that uh, we make meaningful inroads to reduce the cost of health care overall, um, uh, secure pricing, transparency and reforms, and as well as making sure that we get our prescription drug crisis under control in Minnesota is a, is a big area of passion of mine. Hi, I'm Representative Mary Kunish Podin. I represent 41B, which is Columbia Heights and Hilltop, St. Anthony Village, and the southern half of New Brighton. This is my first time um, in this committee, so I'm really excited to learn all about uh, what we do and, and what we can do to make um, health insurance and access to medical uh, care as affordable and accessible and equitable to all. Good afternoon. I'm Patty Acom, uh, Representative Patty Acom. I'm representing Minnetonka and Plymouth and Woodland. And um, my reason for being here is really that I'm a cancer survivor. And so my experience really impressed upon me how important it is that everyone have access to good quality and affordable health care because we don't know when we're going to need it. So thank you. <coughs> Madam Chair, Robert Bierman, Representative of Apple Valley, part of Lakeville. I uh, ran for office partly as a small business owner who needed to see some changes in health care and the cost of health care specifically for our business. Uh, struggled with it for 25 years and an ever-increasing costs. And um, so I wanted to be on this committee. I also uh, am interested in elder care and end-of-life issues and opioids and addiction in general. Thanks. Madam Chair, my name is Mahmoud Nur. I represent uh, Minneapolis District 60B. Um, one of my main interests is addressing how we take care of the most vulnerable members of our society and making sure that there's equity in the programs that we run here at the, um, uh, at the state. Liz Olson, I represent District 7B, which is the central and west parts of Duluth. And 
what falls under the jurisdiction of this community touches all of our lives, touches the, our constituents' lives in some really deep and powerful ways. And um, I worked at a homeless shelter where you see people that are falling through the cracks in a lot of different ways in our society. And I see the decisions we've made here and how they can impact people's lives for the best and they can impact people's lives for the worst. And I wanna make sure that we're doing it for the best. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Rita Moran, District 65A. Uh, my district is right outside of the Capitol here. Uh, West on University Avenue. Uh, I'm in my fifth term here in all five terms I have been a part of Health and Human Service in some capacity whether it's been finance or reform. I am the current chair of Health and Human Service Policy. Um, and it's important to me because of course we you know we want to create access to health care. We want it to be affordable. But we also need to look at the health disparities that we have in communities of color and you know really begin to uh, utilize uh, more of a prevention model. Well, good afternoon. I'm State Representative Diane Loeffler. I represent 15 neighborhoods of Minneapolis in the northeast and northern southeast part of the city. Um, that's the more modest parts of the city. And um, I have been involved in health and human services um, for a long time. I was involved actually when Minnesota, in a diff very different role when Minnesota Care first passed. Um, but on this committee, I've also, in addition to working on health care, worked a lot on the human services side. Um, uh, inspired by people in my family who've run into issues, as well as other people I know um, in working on services for people with disabilities, with mental health challenges, um, or people who at the end of the life are running into frail health and, and affordability issues for the basics. Um, and having served on this committee for a long time, one of my goals, because we have never had a positive, wonderful target like other committees, um, one of my goals has always been really to push prevention and, um, you know, we'd much rather have people avoid cancer than get cancer and have good care. And so um, a big focus of mine has been health improvement and prevention and on refocusing um, our services and reforming them so we get better outcomes at stable or lesser costs. And I think we all have to step up to that because this committee always is challenged. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Rod Hamilton. I represent District 22B, which is the southwestern part of the state. Uh, Worthington would be the largest community. Um, I've said, um, um, well, when you roll in someone else's shoes, you look at life a little bit differently. I have a strong passion for health and human services and, and helping those uh, individuals who are in need. Um, Madam Chair, I don't know if you remember, but back when we had freshman orientation and our bus wouldn't start, uh, I believe it was you and Representative Loeffler and Representative Poppy and former Representative Denise Dietrich. We all rode back to the cities uh, in a vehicle. I was the only male and only Republican in that. And, <laughs> and I think it was uh, divine intervention maybe uh, that brought us together because I think that uh, we're gonna be able to work on some issues very, very important to the state of Minnesota. And, and uh, Madam Chair, I'm very open, uh, very open this year as far as uh, policies that are being uh, brought forward. And I want you to know that. I have some personal experiences with some issues that took place uh, with individuals making decisions as it pertains to my health care. And I believe they are practicing uh, those decisions without a license. And when we have the opportunity, I want to be able to share my experiences, not only mine, but that of uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of other individuals who have contacted me uh, with issues as well. So um, I simply want to say I'm very open to ideas that you bring forward, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, members. I, um, you know, in the past, sometimes people have thought that no one wanted to serve on Health and Human Services. <laughs> but I won't remind you of the nickname that it has, which sometimes is kind of deserved, but it's really delightful to see so many people who really do want to work on these issues because they are complicated, and there are lots and lots of them. And so, um, one of the reasons, in fact, the big reason that I have asked um, our, our um, house research staff to start off with giving us some overviews is that in order to really come together and think about solutions to problems, we first have to really be on the same page as far as what the facts are. What do we do? And so that's why I hope that you will pay close attention to the overviews, um, even if you've been through this before. Um, and. Um, but, so I want to back up just a bit and talk about the rules uh, for the committee. The rules are in your packet. Um, they're pretty self-explanatory. I just want to flag a couple of things. 
One is that I am not starting out with a 24-hour amendment rule. And so those of you who know me know why. Um, and I intend to keep that, that openness as long as we are using it seriously to work together. Because in my view, committee time is the time we work on bills. We are not, unless the time becomes impossible, and I, I can't say this won't happen at the very end when we have deadlines, but as far as possible, I want us to really discuss bills in good faith and try to work on them and make them better. And that sometimes will mean that you didn't have time to read the bill before and you might have a great idea in committee, and I don't want you to be stifled in bringing that idea forward because you didn't meet an arbitrary rule. So that's, that's why I'm doing that, and I will continue that as long as there's kind of a good faith effort that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try. If you have a substantial amendment, please try to get it in ahead so that, how, so that House Research can help us draft it. It puts a burden on them to have things happen on the fly because they've got to put it in form that we could actually put it in a bill. But, you know, there's where we are. Um, the other thing I wanted to just mention here is that it's not actually in the rules, but um, in my other committee this morning, the issue of treats was brought up, and the so-called rule about uh, new members when you present a first bill, you will hear people say that you're required to bring treats on the first. I don't think that's a real rule. Just, you know, if you wanted to do it, you can do it. But here's my, here's my rule about that, though. This is a health committee. We should have healthy treats in this no. committee. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, can, you can eat that stuff in your other committees, but we have to model, we have to model healthy behavior in this Don't committee. Don't eat their health. Don't eat their health. And, you know, our, um, our, our legislative session, as all of you know who are returning members, it's a pretty unhealthy place around here. Between sitting hours and hours, not getting enough sleep, being stressed out, and then eating crappy food on top of it, so to the extent it's possible, really the only members. <laughs> <laughs> this, is what, this is what you get to do when you're a chair. <laughs> Senator so anyway, that is my request to you, that all treats shared with the committee be healthy treats, OK? All right, so with that, um, back to the actual agenda here. Um, and um, so. What, what I'd like to do, because we have a, this overview, you will see there is a lot of material to be covered. So I'm going to ask all of you to please hold your questions until the end of each section, unless you have the kind of question that really needs to be answered so we can continue, such as, what is that acronym? You know, if that's the kind of question, or what are you talking about, or what page are we on, please raise your hand for that. Other than that, let's try to get through sections and just write down your questions so you don't forget. And you know, maybe you'll hear the answer before we get there. And that way, hopefully, we'll move more smoothly through the overview. So with that, I would ask um, House Research to come up to the table and, um, and get set up. And just, just to make it clear to the new members, so the folks that are talking to you now are our nonpartisan House Research staff. They are, they are available to all members to help with issues. Um, and they draft bills, and they give you background information, and they are incredibly knowledgeable, hardworking folks. I don't know how they do it sometimes. And, um, Maybe, too, as we start, Mr. Chan, I don't know if you had this in there, but maybe you could just explain your, your sort of confidentiality role so that members understand about that piece of it as well. Sure. Uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, we work for members on a, uh, on a nonpartisan, confidential basis. And what that really means is that, um, we, you know, we don't advocate for any positions. We work with, with all parties. Um, regarding confidentiality, if one of you as a member asks me to draft a bill or an amendment, I don't share that information. I, I don't tell others. I don't tell other members, for example, that, you know, so-and-so asked me to draft a bill or an amendment. Um, because of that, it can lead to certain situations where I might know that two members are working on the same proposal and, you know, maybe they, they would like to work together. but. Because of our confidentiality rules, I don't share that. So it really is up to you as members or perhaps your, your caucus staff to sort of you know, coordinate this work among 
members. And the other, I guess, thing to keep in mind is that we may be working on putting a bill together for the majority party, an, an omnibus uh, spending bill. At the same time, you know, we'll be drafting amendments for, say, the minority party that could make quite radical changes to that bill. And it's all part of our job as nonpartisan <coughs> staff. Thank you. So, okay. So, okay, should I? Go ahead. Uh, so, Madam Chair and members, uh, there's a lot of material to cover, so this will be a two part presentation. Uh, we'll start first with the, uh, the health care programs, and then uh, on, on the second day, we'll move more toward the income maintenance and social service programs. Um, the one thing I want to mention is that Sarah Sunderman is a member of the uh, HHS uh, team at House Research. She is on maternity leave and will be returning in February. So for the meanwhile, we're sort of filling in uh, for her. She covers uh, chemical and mental health issues, child support, <coughs> child welfare, uh, state operated services and other things. So we'll be really, we'll be presenting her slides, but at, at, a, at a very high level of, of, uh, de of detail. So we're operating off the uh, slide presentation uh, overview of committee jurisdiction. Uh, this first slide is the all funds expenditures that counts federal spending as well. It's base level funding for fiscal years uh, 20 and 21. So total spending 39.165 billion. And as you can see, the Human Services Department really has the vast majority of this spending, followed by the Health Department at 2.9%, then MinSure, which is the state insurance exchange, and health-related and other boards. Uh, some general principles regarding the health care, economic assistance, and social service programs. In general, these programs are state supervised and county administered. So the Department of Human Services or DHS would be the primary agency that oversees these programs. They supervise uh, administration by the counties, they ensure compliance with federal laws, they provide training and other <laughs> assistance to counties. Counties in turn administer the programs for most of the programs, they accept applications and determine <coughs> eligibility and contract often with local service providers. The U.S. Congress sets broad standards and requirements for the programs that get federal funding. The Minnesota legislature sets the overall human services policy, and this is often influenced by uh, federal requirements. This slide is, um, <clears throat> shows spending just within the Department of Human Services. And again, uh, over three, three quarters of the spending is for the medical assistance program and the other programs are, are listed as well. So we'll start first with the healthcare programs. Go over some, maybe some general uh, principles first. So in, uh, in Minnesota, people with low to middle incomes can obtain <coughs> subsidized health, health coverage to three main programs, medical assistance, or MA, the state's Medicaid program, it's administered within broad federal guidelines, uh, Minnesota Care, it was a state-only program established in 1992, and since 2015, it's functioning as a basic health program under the Affordable Care Act. And MinSure is the state health insurance exchange, and it's through that system that people obtain uh, premium or coverage with premium tax credits and, and cost sharing reductions. So these three programs or systems provide a, a rough continuum of, co of coverage for many Minnesotans. Uh, for example, for adults without children and parents and caretakers, the first step would be uh, MA coverage, uh, up to 133% of the federal poverty guidelines. And I should mention that one of the extra handouts, um, it's a, it's a Depart Department of Human Services uh, table income and asset guidelines. So you may want to refer to that when we, when we refer to the federal poverty guidelines. Uh, then Minnesota Care, 
uh, for people with incomes over 133 and up to 200 percent of the poverty guidelines, and then Minsure tax credits from 200 to 400 percent of the poverty guidelines. And then covered services and enrollee costs will, will vary across this continuum. <clears throat> so turn now to medical assistance. MA is a jointly funded uh, federal state program. Again, it's the state's Medicaid program. Uh, Medicaid programs were established by the federal government in 1965. So each state operates one. They operate these programs under broad federal parameters. So the actual details of, uh, of a state Medicaid program would vary from other state Medicaid programs. Uh, as mentioned, the county agencies administer MA under the supervision of DHS, <coughs> and they determine eligibility for persons who are elderly, blind, or have disabilities. The Minnesota Eligibility Technology System, or METS, is used by DHS and the counties to determine eligibility for families and children and adults without children. And this is a system that operates uh, through, through Minsure. Uh, DHS uses uh, two main systems to deliver services to MA enrollees. First is the fee-for-service system, where providers are reimbursed under fee schedules. And in, you know, in general, when providers bill for a service, they're reimbursed for that service. So it sort of pays for specific or, or in instances of service. And then DHS also contracts with managed care and county-based purchasing plans and these plans receive a monthly capitation payment for each enrollee. So this is the managed care system. Going over eligibility, to be eligible for MA, you need to belong to the eligible group, meet income and applicable asset limits, be a U.S. citizen or a legal non-citizen. Also mentioned that MA provides up to three months of retroactive coverage if it's determined that the person would have been eligible for those months. Uh, going over eligible groups, uh, MA coverage is available for children, parents and caretakers, pregnant women, elderly, persons with disabilities, and adults without children. And adults without children are a group added relatively recently uh, as part of the uh, Affordable Care Act expansion option. And extending coverage to this group essentially allowed all major groups of, of individuals to qualify for MA. Um, Prior to that, if you were an adult without children, you would be covered only if you fell into some other eligibility group, such as uh, being elderly or having a disability. Uh, this table just lists some of the MA income limits. They vary by eligibility group uh, using the federal poverty guidelines. And you can see there's a wide range. Uh, from 100% of the poverty guidelines for the aged, blind, and disabled, going up to 283% of the poverty guidelines for children under age two. And, and, and what this really means is that um, members of a family may, may not all be eligible for MA because of these different income limits, with the, you know, the income limit for parents, for example, being lower than the income limit for, for children. Um, the MA program uh, uses an income methodology to determine eligibility. It basically excludes or disregards various types of income. So this is sort of a, a net income standard. Um, the Affordable Care Act has required states to use the, the MAGI or Modified Adjusted Gross Income uh, methodology for um, these, these groups listed here, parents, children, pregnant women, and adults without children. Affordable Care Act also requires a standard, use of a standard 5% income disregard, which replaced uh, other state income disregards. Uh, this next slide, this goes over the, the concept of a spend down. And the spend down works by allowing individuals whose incomes are above the specified income limit <coughs> to spend down by occurring medical, medical bills in amounts that exceed the amount of income that they have in excess of the following spend down limits. 
And then these are the spend down limits, 133% of poverty for families and children, and 80% of the poverty guidelines for persons who are elderly or disabled or blind, and this will go up by one percentage point effective June 1st of 2019. And there's no spend down option for adults without children. Some uh, MA enrollees uh, need to meet asset standards. Um, there's, there's no asset limit for pregnant women, children, and parents and caretakers who are not on a spend down, and also no asset limit for adults without children. So the groups subject to an asset limit are parents and caretakers, and the elder, elderly blind and disabled. The MA program covers all federally, federally mandated and most optional health care services. The federal Medicaid law sort of divides services into uh, required and optional services. Although I'll note that the concept of optional services, these are still often services that are in, in, in great demand. You know, for example, some optional services are audiologist services, chiropractic services, and dental services, and a range of other services. The uh, MA benefit set tends to be comprehensive compared to private sector coverage. Uh, for example, it usually covers a wider range of long-term care services. And the, uh, the Affordable Care Act requires persons covered as newly elig eligible under the MA expansion, which would be our adults without children, to be provided with benchmark or benchmark equivalent benefits. And one of the options there was just to use the state's regular Medicaid benefit set. So that's what Minnesota has chosen. The uh, MA program does not charge enrollee premiums. There, there is a... Uh, family deductible that applies to fee-for-service enrollees and their various co-payments. And under federal law, for most of the MA population, these, uh, the cost sharing must, must be nominal. And children and pregnant women are exempt from cost sharing. The MA program is jo jointly, fan jointly uh, financed by the state and federal government. The standard federal match is 50% uh, for Minnesota. It's, it's sort of based on state per capita income, so our standard federal match tends to be lower than, than other states. And the state general fund would pay the remaining 50% 50, 50 and for certain services there is also a required county share. The federal children's health insurance program provides an enhanced match of 88% through uh, federal fiscal year uh, 19, and, and then this will eventually drop back to the regular enhanced match of 65%. Um, for the adults without children under the, uh, the ACA Medicaid expansion option, the uh, current match is 93% uh, for uh, 2019. I, I didn't update this slide, so it's 93% for 2019 and then it will phase down to 90% federal match for 2020 and future years. The next several slides will go over the uh, managed care component of medical assistance. So majority of MA enrollees receive covered services through HMOs or county-based purchasing plans. So as of July of 18, about 890,000 people were, uh, in, were served through managed care. So this is a, you know, a majority of MA enrollees. Uh, families and children and adults without children and the elderly are required to enroll in managed care, and persons with disabilities may, may opt out and remain in fee-for-service. So each uh, managed care plan has to provide or arrange for most MA covered services, including 180 days of nursing home services and also elderly waiver services. Um, each plan determines its own provider network and it sets its own provider payment rates. So the, the, state, or the state doesn't have you know, direct control over what managed care plans pay to their contracted providers. Uh, since 2012, the state has used competitive bidding 
uh, to uh, and, and enroll, I guess, managed care plans or to choose managed care plans to provide services. Uh, since uh, 2016, competitive bidding has been used uh, statewide. And beginning in uh, 2020, the Department of Human Services will be seeking competitive bids for the MA families and children in greater Minnesota. So that would be for the 2020, I guess, service year. And then for 2021, they will, com they will competitive bid contracts to serve the metro area. So these are sort of new or, or renewals of, of the competitive bidding process. Um, basically, I think in the interest of time, I won't go much over this, the, the rest of this slide. Again, again, I'll just encourage you if you have questions about or need more detailed information about any of the things we're talking about, we're glad to meet with you individually. Uh, this slide, Chun? yes. Mr. Chun, just one thing. Um, just in terms of terminology, like I tend to use the term PMAP, mm -hmm. and um, that's what we're talking about here. I don't think the term is in the slide, but sure. I just want to flag that, right? Because we often, I think I'm not the only one who calls it that. So this right. system where the HMOs mm -hmm. are managing our care for people on Medicaid, we call prepaid medical assistance yes. program. Yes, um, uh, Madam Chair, yes. Um, uh, just to clarify, so ma managed care would refer to both PMAP or the prepaid medical assistance program. And there are also certain uh, managed care programs that are tailored to either the elderly population or, or persons with disabilities, and, and those would have different names. For example, Minnesota Senior Health Options is one managed care program for persons who are elderly. So the uh, Integrated Health Partnership Demonstration, it's a provider direct contracting program uh, where DHS contracts with providers called Integrated Health Partnerships to provide services to both MA and Minnesota care enrollees in both the fee-for-service and managed care systems. So it uses what's called a value-based payment model. Um, all IHPs would receive population-based payments for, to provide care coordination services. And then the larger IHPs, the ones that are more integrated, can enter into a risk slash gain sharing arrangement uh, where they share in savings and losses with, with DHS. And this is a fairly large uh, demonstration project. In uh, 2018, there were 24 IHPs under contract providing services to uh, 450,000 state program enrollees. And the department has estimated savings for the period 2013 to 2017 to, about, to be about $277 million. million. Uh, this slide is just goes over uh, the total spending and state, federal, county spending for MA and also MA enrollment all for fiscal year 17. And Madam Chair, I could stop now if you like and take any questions on medical assistance. Sure. Um, questions for members? Do you, is, um, is, do you have a list? Okay. Are we keeping a list? Okay. Um, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks for the presentation, uh, Mr. Chun. <clears throat> You're like an encyclopedia when it comes to this subject. Uh, the uh, just back on page two, it you show 14.73 billion. That's the state share in a biennium. What is the total budget with the federal match? I think it's close to thirty billion dollars, or what is the two-year? Um, mm -hmm. um, Madam Chair, I, I would have to check uh, the the forecast documents. Will will we'll have that, but I don't I don't have that handy unless. But, but. Mr. Burke? Madam Chair, I also don't have that number right at hand. I will mm -hmm. forward it to maybe the committee administrator, the committee secretary, and, and have that sent around. It's around $32 billion. Yeah, yeah. It's, in that. it's about twice the state <clears throat> spent. Yeah. One, Madam yeah. Chair, I just think the new members should realize that that is the state share alone mm -hmm. over a two-year period of time, and we get almost a 50% match from the feds. We're up to 30, in the neighborhood of $32 billion. And, uh, so uh, 
anyway, I'll leave it at that for right now. Yeah, and thank you for that, Representative Grunhagen. Um, I, I also think it's that's a really important slide to make note of because what it really shows is how much more money we spend on medical assistance than on all these other things. And but I think it's important to note too though where that money goes in medical assistance. And um, I know that in the what we just heard, we heard about the um, about the program, but we didn't really hear the proportion of where the money and, and maybe um, maybe we'll get to that later because I think that's going to be really important for members of this okay. committee to understand sure. You know that is a lot of money I think we all could agree with that and we need to understand where it's being spent Representative yep. Grunhagen. Oh, thank you madam chair. <clears throat> yeah I think an interesting thing for all of us to do especially new members mm -hmm. is take the total budget you know of uh, me of uh, med Medicaid spending uh, multiply it times 76.7%, which is what's spent on Medicaid, and divide that by a million one hundred and one thousand, and you'll get a figure that's hard to believe that we're spending per, per person. Okay, and it's so I I agree with uh, Madam Chair. It's a lot of money, and we really need to know where it's going and make sure it's being put to the best use to, uh, for the citizens of the state of Minnesota. Yeah. Thank you. Well, great, um, Representative Munson. Yep. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. On uh, on page mm -hmm. ten of the uh, printed uh, document, the 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 slide that says MA financing, um, the second bullet point that talks about the federal children's health insurance program, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that it was a uh, uh, federal match of eighty eight percent, but then it's going to go down to sixty five percent. Is that correct, Mr. Mr. Chuck? Oh uh, yes, Representative Munson. And the, there's a phase in where the match will be seventy six point five percent for fiscal year twenty, and then from 21 on, it goes back to its regular, or, or the standard higher enhanced match of 65%. Thank you, Mr. Chung, Madam Chair. The, um, do we have a, a, an estimated uh, dollar amount increase in, uh, in state, an estimated state uh, increase in spending? Is this, it looks like it's gonna be about a 23% increase in state spending for, for, uh, for this program. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Munson, I, I, I don't have that figure. I think that's something that is, is either in or could be reconstructed from the, the budget forecast pages for, for that. Okay. Uh, and Madam Chair, I guess yeah, the, 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 the third point um, for the, uh, the Affordable Care Act expansion of Medicaid dollars, um, also dropping from the federal match of 94% of what we spend uh, going down to only 90%, I, I would be really interested to know from uh, nonpartisan staff if we could have a an estimated dollar increase for these two uh, for these two items. Thank you, Representative Munson. I think that's an entirely reasonable question. Um, Doug Berg stepped out for a moment, probably to get the answer to the previous question, and he's the guy that could probably give that to us. And um, so I, I think we're going to be digging into this much more deeply as we go along. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and you might just write that down, and you could, if we don't get the answer, you could you could ask him. I think he could directly give you that. That answer. Um, are there other questions? Okay, um, Representative Chairman, um, Mad Madam Chair, just a question on the HMO payment rates mm -hmm. on page ten. You might understand that the HMOs don't have a schedule of payments. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Bierman, the, the, the HMOs would, could, would the, the state doesn't, I guess, direct how HMOs should pay their providers. Um, presumably, many of them would use some type of fee schedule. I know in some cases, the, fed, the fee schedule is sort of based or linked to medical assistance. But it's different in the sense that for fee for service, the state or the Department of Human Services does have a specified, you know, payment methodology or, or fee schedule, whereas we we leave it up to the, in the, uh, the the contracts between an HMO and the provider as to how the provider would be reimbursed. So it's probable that those costs, from place to place, could be different and non-standard. Across uh, the state, Madam Chair of Bierman, I. I think that's certainly a, a possibility that there is not, you know, uniformity across HMOs and what they pay for a particular, to a particular provider. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you. And uh, Representative Bierman, you have hit upon a big issue <laughs> mm. that I hope we're going to spend some time discussing, and that is that very often in this committee, we are talking about how, you know, we spend all this money in medical assistance, and often we hear that our constituents aren't getting the service that we believe we're paying for. This comes up a lot with dental care, but it comes up with mental health and other things as well. And sometimes we appropriate money to raise rates for certain providers and then come to find out that we don't have any control and can't even really know that those providers got the extra money that we appropriated. So this has been a big issue for all of us around the table and, and one that I hope that we can work on together this year. Thank you. Mr. John. Uh, so, Madam Chair, members, and we'll continue with the Minnesota Care Program. Uh, this is a, a jointly funded federal state program that provides coverage uh, mainly to parents and caretakers and adults without children. The program was originally established as a state program in 1992, but since 2015 has operated under a basic, as a basic health program under the Affordable Care Act. And I won't go over this slide in, in detail, but the Affordable Care Act, I think, basically envisioned basic health programs as sort of a transition program between a state's Medicaid program and subsidized coverage to the state insurance um, exchanges. The Minnesota Care Program is administered uh, by the state through the Department of Human Services Central Office. Uh, DHS contracts with managed care and county-based purchasing plans to provide services to enrollees. Um, so uh, the Minnesota Care Program is, is, is almost all uh, delivered through, through managed care. The, the MET system or the system developed under MNSURE is the system used to determine enrollee eligibility. To be eligible for Minnesota Care, you need to meet income limits. Um, there's no program asset limit. You need to meet some requirements related to lack of access to health insurance and not be MA eligible. You need to be a Minnesota reg resident and be a citizen or legal non-citizen. Uh, so the income limit for Minnesota care, you have to have an income greater than 133%, but not exceeding 200% of the poverty guidelines, and there are certain exceptions to the income floor for uh, specified groups. The thinking here is that with persons with incomes below 133% below of poverty are, would be eligible for medical assistance, and those with incomes above 200% of poverty would be able to obtain uh, subsidized coverage through MNSURE, through the premium tax credits. Uh, since January of 2014, uh, there's been no asset limit for Minnesota Care. This is part of compliance with the Affordable Care Act requirements. There are some uh, certain uh, provisions called insurance barriers. Uh, a, a person must not have uh, minimum essential coverage, and this is the, the, using the definition under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, persons also must not have access to subsidized coverage that is affordable and also provides minimum value. Since January of 14, if you're eligible for MA, you are not eligible for Minnesota Care, and this is a relatively recent change. Prior to that, people could choose the program. Uh, this has had the effect of shifting most children and pregnant women from Minnesota care to medical assistance, since the MA income limits for these groups is, is, is higher. The program has several benefit sets. Mm -hmm. Pregnant women and children have access to the broadest range of services, ne nearly all MA benefits, with the exception of certain long-term care services. And then parents and adults without children are eligible for most MA services, but, but not as many as pregnant women and children. And the program meets the Affordable Care Act requirements that a basic health program provide at least the essential health benefits, which we'll um, cover in another section. Minnesota care enrollees who are age 20, 21 and older would, would pay premiums based on a sliding scale. So children are exempt from premiums. 
persons with incomes below 35 percent of the poverty guidelines pay no premiums and American Indians and Alaska Natives are also exempt from premiums and there was also a recent you know increase in premiums in 2015 there are, are various uh, co-insurance and co-payment requirements and <clears throat> excuse me I should mention that one of the additional handouts it's a it's a DHS document called summary of coverage cost sharing and limits it's a single page uh, double-sided uh, this provides more detailed information on covered services for MA and Minnesota care also more information on the specific cost sharing requirements for each program Oh, Mr. Chun, yes. is this this is the document you're talking uh, Madam about? Madam Chair, yes, that's that's correct. Members yes. should have it in your packets. And just some recent history: uh, cost sharing for the program was increased uh, January of 2016, and the Department of Human Services is required to adjust co-payments, co-insurance, and deductibles to maintain an actuarial value of 94 percent. And I, I should just mention um, actuarial value. It's the percentage of, of uh, total average health care costs for covered benefits that are actually paid you know, by, by the health plan. The Minnesota Care Program is funded by a 2% tax on the gross revenues of health care providers. Uh, this is scheduled in law to sunset beginning in calendar year 2020. And there's also a 1% tax on nonprofit health plan premiums and money is from these uh, as uh, deposited into the health care access fund. Um, as a basic health program, the state receives from the federal government 95% of the value of premium tax credits and cost sharing reductions that would otherwise have been paid or would, it, would otherwise have been provided had the Minnesota care program not uh, existed. Uh, this slide here, it just shows uh, spending uh, enrollee premium receipts and average monthly enrollees for the Minnesota Care program. And Madam Chair, I could stop here as well for questions. What are the questions? Any questions for members? Um, and before we um, go to that, just to, um, Mr. Berg gave me the answer to a previous question about the uh, all funds budget for for DHS. So. The, the fiscal year 2021 budget, which is a forecasted budget, is $37.7 billion. <clears throat> That's the, uh, from That's both the federal and the state share. And Mr. Berg, did you want to clarify any more about that? Uh, Madam Chair, not much other than I'll just comment that like this, like many things, it's sort of how, you, how much it is depends on how you count it. There is funding at DHS, which I excluded from that, which we would not normally include. i looking at it, there's a couple other things I probably would exclude if I hadn't been doing it on fly, but for instance, child support enforcement uh, payments. Almost all of that money in the state of Minnesota flows through the DHS budget, and we appropriate it in our bill. We never count that as part of our budget because it goes through pursuant to uh, judicial orders and is distributed to the parties that are supposed to get it. So mm -hmm. it depends a little bit on how you look at it. Right, and just a quick comment to going back to Representative Grunhagen's question before and about how the average seems to be so high when you look at how many people and so on. You know, we really will need to break down, and probably DHS can help us with this, what we're talking about, because in that bucket are things, it's not just health care for people, it's disability services, some some for very, very needy and fragile people. Um, it's elderly, it, all the waivers are in there, right, Mr. Berg? So we're talking about all the disability services, all the elderly services. So, so some of that uh, for certain individuals can be very, very expensive. So the average may be pulled up by that, but we'll, we'll get into that as we go along. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what our neighboring states uh, average cost is how many you know the amount of people they have on the Medicaid program and then what their average cost is comparing to the state of Minnesota now there might be reasons why we're higher in some areas or lower or whatever but it, it does help lay people like ourselves and all of us generally are lay people 
to help evaluate the programs when we see comparative and historical analysis. And uh, so that's just a thought to throw out there. Yep. But I did have a question about Minnesota Care, if I could ask that, please. please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, and I, you may have touched on this already. I was doing some figuring here. But with Minnesota Care, if I remember right, in the last biennium, the federal government subsidized Minnesota Care uh, at about 90 percent. But that's going down in the upcoming biennium, correct? Mr. John? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Goonhagen, the federal payment for basic health program is 95% of what would otherwise have been paid with advanced premium tax credits and cost sharing reductions. What I'm not sure of and would need to check with management and budget about is whether because of the recent federal decision uh, not to fund cost sharing reductions, I don't know whether that affects the BHP uh, Minnesota Care funding. Well, thank you. Um, Representative May. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this goes back to Representative Grunhagen's comment uh, about what are our neighbors spending, which is, I think is a great question to ask. However, I think we just need to be cognizant of when we ask such questions that that question does not live in a vacuum when it comes to health care. We also need to ask, and what are their health care outcomes? Mm -hmm. Keeping that in mind. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Representative kunish Padin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Chung, would you uh, explain to us why American Indians and Alaska Nava Natives are exempt from um, the Minnesota cost sharing as well as the, um, the um, not MA eligible? Um, Madam Chair, Representative Kunish Padin, the, the f federal law has um, provided various uh, cost sharing exemptions for American Indians and Alaska Natives in, in a number of, for a number of programs, uh, especially medical assistance and, and, and also, you know, Minnesota care. So it, it's, I, I would say it's part of maybe a, br a broader uh, policy on the part of the federal government. Follow up? It, um, would it be safe to say that due to um, federal agreements between the sovereign nations of the, of the Native Americans that it's our responsibility or it was a, the agreement that we would, um, that our, our states and our country would cover the cost of those medical cares for, for our indigenous people? Mr. Chan. Uh, Madam Chair of Sukunish Padin, I, I'm afraid I, I don't know enough about, say, uh, American Indian law and related issues to, to really an answer that. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, you have stumped Mr. Chan. That is a rare thing, <laughs> <laughs> Representative. So maybe when we, um, you know, maybe we can get the answer to that probably from DHS. I would, I would imagine that we might be able to to find out. That's a great question. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we, I'm seeing no more questions. Mr. Chun, maybe you want to continue. Sure. So Madam Chair, we'll now move to the uh, health insurance exchange and the subsidies that are available through the exchange. So the Affordable Care Act required states or the federal government of states didn't act to establish health insurance exchanges beginning in 2014. Uh, Minnesota chose to establish a state-run exchange codified in Chapter 62V of our law. Uh, the exchange uh, helps with the selection and purchase of health coverage by individuals. And there's a, actually a typo here. The, I think on your paper copies, the small employers on the third bullet should actually read families. So it should read as it is in this, uh, on the screen. And it, the exchanges also help determine eligibility for premium tax credits and cost sharing reductions. So the exchange is sort of a common entry point to apply for health coverage, whether subsidized coverage in the private sector or through a state program. The <clears throat> federal government funds premium tax credits available through the exchange. The federal government had funded cost sharing reductions as, as well. Uh, but the cost sharing reductions have not, have not been reimbursed to insurers since October of 2017. 
but the requirement that uh, insurers provide these cost sharing reductions uh, is, you know, still applies. And I'll go over what those are in, in a slide to come. To be eligible for premium tax credits and other subsidies, you need to meet the general requirements to be to obtain coverage through the exchange, which is that you are a citizen or a legal non-citizen and that you are not incarcerated. Um, income in the case of Minnesota must be greater than 200 percent but not exceeding 400 percent of the poverty guidelines. There's a lower income limit of 250 percent of poverty for cost sharing reductions. And you also really not have not you, you cannot have other types of specified coverage such as employer coverage or coverage through Medicaid or other programs. The uh, covered services are basically the essential health benefits as defined by the Affordable Care Act. The second bullet on the slide lists the 10 major uh, categories of, of essential health benefits. The uh, enrollee is responsible for the premiums of any policy for any you know, insurance that they purchase through the exchange, but they may be eligible for premium tax credits. So premium tax credits, um, uh, what, what they do is they limit premium payments to a specified percentage of income. So this income range of what a person would need to pay ranges between 6.5 4% of income for persons at 200% of poverty going up to 9.86% of income at 400% of poverty. The amount of the premium tax credit would be the difference between this income share that the person needs to pay for insurance and the cost of what is called the sort of the benchmark plan which is the second lowest cost silver plan being sold. And I know that's sort of a confusing concept, but, but basically it, it, it is a benchmark to determine the maximum amount of a premium tax credit that a person can receive. The, this next slide goes over the, the reference to cost sharing, the title, it should say cost sharing subsidies. So there was, there was a, a typo. So health insurance are required to provide cost-sharing subsidies to persons with incomes not exceeding 250% of poverty. They need to purchase a plan at the silver level. Um, I should mention that the ACA sets out four metal levels, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, and these have you know, different actuarial values. So the silver plan is a 70% actuarial value. What the cost-sharing subsidy does is it would have the effect of raising the actuarial value of this plan to 73 percent. Insurers can have, have flexibility in how they achieve this higher actuarial value, but it's often done by reducing a plan's annual out-of-pocket limit. Um, and as I mentioned, the federal government as of October of 2017 has terminated cost-sharing reduction payments to insurers because they had been reimbursing insurers for the cost of providing this. Um, so uh, some analysts, I, I guess, are projecting that, that the, because the plan still will need to provide cost sharing reductions, it could lead to an increase in the average premium. Uh, <clears throat> the federal government pays for all of the costs of premium tax credits. So in Minnesota for 2017, uh, Mincher enrollees were projected to receive 372.2 million in premium tax credits. And the average monthly tax credit, this is as of November of 18, was uh, $475 per month for a, a household. And I guess, Madam Chair, I can stop there for questions on the exchange and tax credits. Okay. Um, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I, you know, and I just make this suggestion to the committee. I really think we should look at, you know, if we terminated Min, uh, Minsher and went to the federal exchange, would there be a savings? I know it can be a touchy subject, but I just hope in the future we could actually have an analysis that would show us if there would be substantial savings by using the federal exchange versus continuing to maintain 
the state exchange. I'm just throwing that out for food for thought. Thank you. Representative Schultz. I think we already have an answer to that, Representative Grunhagen. So we had a health care finance task force that met for a year, um, two years ago, to tackle that very question. And we had experts um, come to us, the committee, which was made up of um, bipartisan legislators, stakeholders, experts. I think there were 29 people in the task force, providers, health insurance representatives. And we concluded that it would cost the state more money if we went to the federal exchange. And I'll, I'll send you that report. All right. Thank you. Um, is there other questions at this point? Okay. And, I, you know, I just wanted to... Um, Make sure that you know, as we go through this, I, I think it's really hard if you're new to this material, but even for those of us who've dealt with it for a while, to kind of keep perspective on what we're talking about here. So as we're talking about, um, and first of all, the terms are very confusing, right? Medical assistance, Minnesota care, Minsure, people get them confused all the time, right? So, but what we're talking about here, the section we've just finished, is talking about people who are buying insurance in the individual market through the Minsure exchange, right? So just to, and Mr. Chun, do you know offhand right now what percentage of the population that would be? I usually think of it as about 5%, about half of whom get the um, premium tax credits and half don't get any help. Is that about right? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, based on some materials that are routinely presented at the Minsure Board means that that sounds about right, but again, I don't have those documents in front of me. Okay, so thank you, Mr. Shaman. So just to flag that for members that, you know, even though every slide is the same, is the same size, it doesn't mean that, you know, the impact on the number of people, not to say that this isn't, you know, everything impacts very strongly, the people it impacts, but just when we're thinking about how our population is distributed here. We're, we're talking about a uh, about 5% of Minnesotans who are buying through Minsure, or could be. So uh, please continue. Um, Madam Chair, I'll just talk briefly about two programs that were um, established in calendar year 2017 to reduce or to contain the cost of individual market premiums. And the first program is the premium subsidy program. It was enacted in 2017, and it operated for calendar year 2017 only. Um, uh, may I stop you for a moment? Oh, you need to introduce yourself for the record. I'm sorry, Madam Chair and members. Um, Elizabeth Clarkvist with House Research. Thank you. Sorry, I'm out of practice. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> um, so for the premium subsidy program, this was administered by MMB, and it reduced individual market premium costs by 25% for um, each enrollee. Um, it provided about $137 million in subsidies for approximately 118,000 Minnesota residents. And then the second program I'll discuss is the Minnesota Premium Security Plan, which is also called reinsurance. Um, it was enacted in 2017, and it began operating in January 2018. It's administered by the Minnesota Comprehensive Health Association, which um, uses the acronym MCHA. And it operates such that um, if an enrollee with individual market coverage has claims costs that are higher than the attachment point, which in statute right now is $50,000. So if an enrollee has more than $50,000 in claims, MCHA pays 80% of the enrollee's claims up to a cap of $250,000 and payments made to the insurer. And any, then any claims costs that exceed the cap are the responsibility of the insurer. And the plan is funded mainly with federal funds and um, also some state money from the general fund and the health care access fund. And um, that's all I have on those two programs. So if you have any questions on those. Okay. Um, Representative Munson. Hi. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, a question on the just the last point there on the plan is funded mainly with federal funds and state money from the general fund and health care access fund. Uh, uh, could you tell me how much money came out of the Healthcare Access Fund for that plan? 
So um, uh, that would be a question that could would more properly be directed to Mr. Berg if, if Mr. Berg is prepared to answer. Uh, Madam Chair, members, the reinsurance bill moved uh, $200 million a year in each in fiscal 18 and fiscal 19 from the health care access fund to the reinsurance plan and an additional $750,000 in the second year, I believe, for some administrative costs. So 400, 401 million in round figures. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Other questions on this piece? Okay. Please continue. Uh, Madam Chair, members, Danielle Pinelli from House Research. Uh, now we're going to move on to a discussion of long-term care. Uh, Long-term care services are available to the elderly and people with disabilities through uh, Medicaid, the, some state programs, and programs that are administered by the Board on Aging. The long-term care services provided under MA include uh, nursing facility services, intermediate care facilities for persons with developmental disabilities, home health care, uh, personal care assistance services, and home and community-based waiver services. And what I would say about these um, is that for, for these MA programs, uh, people eligible under the um, elderly or uh, persons with disability categories must meet income and asset standards that are lower than the standards for other eligibility re uh, categories. And Mr. Chun showed that on one of his slides um, in the MA section. Um, and then people have to meet other requirements um, such as in order to be eligible as elderly, a person needs to be age 65 or older and to be eligible as a person with disabilities, uh, the person must satisfy the disability criteria that's used by the federal Social Security Administration um, or the state medical review team. Um, nursing facilities and intermediate care facilities are institutions and the rest of these services are all home and community based services. Uh, I would just make a note that the, the PCA, the personal care assistance program is scheduled to be replaced by a new program called Community First Services and Supports. And I believe as of now, that's scheduled to happen in June of 2020. Um, and then just some more information on the home and community-based waiver services. Uh, these services cover two different types of service. Uh, they cover services necessary to avoid institutionalization um, that are not covered in the MA state plan and also services that are extensions of Minnesota's MA state plan services. And DHS needs to apply to the federal centers for Medicare and Medicaid services um, in order to, to have these waivers um, and to cover services that wouldn't normally be covered under MA. Um, and Minnesota currently has five waivers. Uh, there's five waiver programs. Four of them are for disability services. And then the last one is the elderly waiver. And, and Ms. Bunielli, could I just stop you for a second? Because I think and members can see we just get really into the weeds here. It gets really complicated. First of all, um, you're using the term state plan. And then the term waiver services, it's really confusing when people get started. I remember when somebody said to me, what do you think about the waivers? When I was just newly elected, I was like, what's being waived? I don't know, what's a waiver? <laughs> so could you just back up for a second and just tell us why, what are we calling, what does it mean to say that something's a wavered service? And what is, a, what is the state plan? How is that different? Uh, so when, the Medicaid program first began, uh, the only, the only long-term care services that were covered were uh, institutional services, so like nursing facility services, for example. Um, and starting in the 1980s, 
the federal government allowed states to cover home and community based long term care services um, through these waivers where you're basically waiving the requirement that the services be provided in an institutional setting. Um, and then the state plan services are um, Randy can probably talk about that more, but those are just the basic Medicaid services that are, are in our state plan for Medicaid that needs to be updated periodically. So am I right then in thinking that anyone who's on Medicaid can access the services that are in our state plan, but there are special services that are only available under these waivers? Is that correct? Yes, Madam Chair, that'd be correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, so long-term care services that are provided by the state include the services listed here. Um, long-term care consultation services provide screening assessment and information and educational services to help individuals access and decide on the appropriate level of long-term care services. Um, the alternative care program provides home and community-based services to individuals who are not MA enrollees, but who are at risk of nursing home placement. This program is very similar to the elderly waiver program, but it's for people who don't yet qualify for MA. This used to be entirely a state-funded program. Um, but beginning in 2014, the state started to receive Medicaid match for it. Uh, the next program is Family Support Grants. This is a grant program that provides state cash assistance for maintaining a child with developmental disabilities or a related condition in the family home. Uh, the Consumer Support Grant Program is a state-funded alternative to MA reimbursed home care, uh, specifically the services of um, a home health aide, PCA, and home care nurse. Um, this is another program that is scheduled to go away in June of 2020 when um, Community First Services and Supports comes online. Uh, the SILS, the Semi-Independent Living Services, are provided to adults with a developmental disability or related condition um, in their home and community to maintain or increase their ability to live in the community. And then final, finally, the Essential Community Support Services um, is a program that was created to provide support services to people who are no longer eligible for nursing facility services or certain waiver services due to changes that were made in the nursing facility level of care that took place um, in 2015. <coughs> this next slide might um, provide a little bit more information on the question that Representative Grunhagen had about where where is the money going. This shows for fiscal year 2018 um, medical assistance enrollees and expenditures by enrollee type. And so my my point by putting this slide here was just to show um, that People, persons with disabilities and the elderly are fairly small um, enrollee groups. Um, and the amount of, of expenditures on those two groups um, is quite large. It's about 58% of, of MA expenditures. And finally, uh, the last slide on long-term care is um, programs that are administered by the Board on Aging. So you can see the services listed here. And then I would just say the Board on Aging is a, it's a 25-member board whose members are appointed by the governor. Uh, staff are provided by DHS, and the board is housed within DHS. And one of the primary functions of the board is to administer Federal Older Americans Act funding. Are we, are we at a stopping point there? Yes, Madam Chair, I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. All right. Are there questions? 
So, Representative Neuer. Madam Chair, I just wanted to inquire about the community first and support uh, program that will be starting 2020. What is the difference between uh, the PCA services and the new program? Ms. Pugnelli. Those two programs are fairly similar. Um, it's, it's still going to be a home and community-based service where individuals will be going to someone's home or helping um, someone in the community um, with their personal needs. Representative Newer. Madam Chair, I just wanted to inquire about also the waiver programs. I know you covered the elderly waiver. Mm -hmm. What are the other programs within the waiver program that we have? Ms. Pugnelli. Uh, so, as I said, there are five waiver programs. Um, they are the Community Alternative Care Waiver Program. It's, it's often called CAC, um, and that provides services for people with chronic illnesses who need the level of care provided in a hospital. Um, there's community access for disability inclusion. That's often called, referred to as CADI, and that provides services for persons with disabilities who need the level of care provided in a nursing home. There's the Developmental Disabilities, or DD, waiver that provides services to people who need the level of care provided in um, an intermediate care facility. And then finally, there's the, the Brain Injury Waiver, which provides services to persons with a traumatic or acquired brain injury who need the level of care provided in either a nursing home or a neurobehavioral hospital. Representative Noor? Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. And, and um, so we have only about five more minutes um, today, right? All right. So um, let's see, are we, uh, does it make sense to start the next section? Or should we, should we pause here? Um, Madam Chair, I, I, I don't think the next section will really take all that long. If okay. you wanted me to try to maybe okay, move let's quickly. Push through sure. Thank you. So Madam Chair, the next section goes over chemical and mental health <laughs> services. The, uh, there are, there are three, three main categories of, the, we'll start with substance use disorder services. So there are three main categories of these services. The first is the uh, Rule 25 assessment, which is an interview with the counselor to assess uh, substance use and treatment needs and placement. And it's conducted by a county or tribal agency. There was legislation passed in 2017 that would allow an individual to go directly to a provider rather than to a county assessor. So that's a provision that's being phased in over a two-year phase-in period through June of 2020. Then there are treatment services, which are listed here, and then finally re recovery services. The uh, counties and tribes are responsible for assessing the treatment needs of residents. It, it's the Rule 25 assessment that was just mentioned. They'll determine the financial eligibility for public programs. They'll uh, work on pre-authorization and placement and the appropriate uh, treatment services. And counties also pay a portion of the costs, 22.95% uh, for non-MA recipients and 30% for MA recipients. The publicly funded uh, substance use disorder treatment is provided either through managed care or under fee-for-service. So under fee-for-service, this is delivered through the Consolidated Chemical Dependency Treatment Fund. So in order to be eligible for services through the fund, you have to meet clinical requirements and either be, be uninsured, be on a public health care program, which would be MA or Minnesota Care, or meet the fund income and household guidelines. Moving to uh, mental health uh, services, the counties are responsible for developing mental health systems for both children and adults. <coughs> this is done uh, in compliance with the uh, Children's Mental Health Act and the Adult Mental Health Act and state law. So funding for mental health comes from a range of sources, uh, federal, state, and county sources. And uh, certain services are also funded through uh, public health care programs or through private insurance. This, uh, I guess, diagram here kind of outlines the six components of mental health service delivery. 
There are various assessments, a diagnostic assessment, which is the initial assessment for services, then a functional assessment and level of care assessment. These determine eligibility for specific, I guess, sets of services. And then from that, an individual treatment plan is delivered, uh, the services are actually delivered, and then there's, a, I guess, a reassessment of the need for services. This slide just lists the, uh, the types of, of mental health services. They're kind of grouped into three main categories, emergency services, uh, residential services, and non-residential services. And this uh, diagram, it kind of shows the continuum of mental health services. The, the names of the services may vary a bit for children and, and adults, but the intent is you're starting on the left side with the less intensive outpatient services, moving to the right with the more intensive uh, resi residential services. The state or Department of Human Services also operates uh, direct care and treatment services. These are for individuals with complex needs related to mental illness, substance use disorder, developmental disabilities, traumatic brain injury, or those committed as mentally ill and dangerous. And this slide, which I think is pretty hard to see, but it, it, it's just, it's a DHS map of the direct care and treatment sites with, you know, coding for the different types of facilities and services. This slide is, is, is listing the main types of direct care and treatment services. There are adult mental health services at, uh, at community behavioral health hospitals and at the Anoka Metro Regional Treatment Center. There are services at St. At Peter at the Minnesota Security Hospital for persons committed as mentally ill and dangerous. There are child and adolescent behavioral health services. Uh, there are community addiction recovery enterprise services. These are inpatient and outpatient chemical dependency and substance use services in six locations. Uh, community support services. Uh, these include residential support services, vocational, day training and habilitation services for persons with developmental disabilities or traumatic brain injury. Rehabilitation services are for persons with serious brain injuries or neurocognitive disorders with challenging behaviors. And then there are uh, forensic uh, services and community dental clinics. All right, so I think we're gonna pause there. And members, before we break, I would just ask you to please save this. Um, I think it's good. We're going to continue on with this um, presentation. So save your slides in your folder, please, in the save folder. But also, I would recommend that you keep it there even afterwards as or, you know, take it to your office as a reference, because this is going to be a great reference for us. And then before we break, I just want to mention, um, I did not introduce our pages, who I understand are maybe not permanent with us in this room, but I, I wanted to introduce um, Mercedes Tuma Hansen. And is that... Emily had to step out. And, and our other was Emily Anderson who had to step out. Okay, thank you. And I also failed to say that Representative Mann is the vice chair for the committee, so there may be times when she's uh, holding the gavel in here. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time. We are adjourned.